Hello, welcome to the channel. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are going to talk about old age security clawback, what it is, and five ways you can avoid it. Look, nobody likes paying the government more than they have to. An old age security clawback can be a big tax on seniors if not planned for properly. So it is very important to make sure that you do just that. So let's first start with the basics. What is OAS? Assuming you have lived in Canada for the required 40 years over the age of 18, you will be eligible for full old age security starting at age 65. In 2022, this is $666.83 monthly. If you are age 65 to 74, and $733.51 if you are aged 75 and older. You can elect to delay your OAS up to age 70 for an increased benefit of 0.6% per month, or a total of 36% if you go the full way to age 70. Okay, so now we have that covered. What exactly is old age security clawback? When your net income exceeds the income threshold set by the government, the OAS paid to you becomes subject to a clawback or a recovery tax as it is officially referred to. The income threshold amount is updated every year. I have included a link to this underneath and a snapshot here. For July 2022 to June 2023 pay period, OAS clawback is triggered when your net income is $79,845 or higher. And this income is based on your 2021 tax return. OAS clawback results in a reduction of OAS benefits by 15 cents for every $1 above the threshold amount and is essentially an additional 15% tax. As an example, let's say your net income was $90,000 in 2020. This would push you $10,155 over the clawback threshold. 15% of 10,155 is 1523.25. In this example, you would have to pay back $1,523.25 for the July 23 to June 2024 period. This would in effect reduce your monthly payment by $126.94. Now, that doesn't exactly sound ideal, does it? So, let's cut to the chase here. Now you know what OAS is and OAS clawback is, how can you avoid it? That's what you came here for at the end of the day. So. Anyway, I'm going to assume that you've done the obvious things like maximise TFSAs where appropriate, taking advantage of income splitting where you can, and utilising all the available deductions to you and focus on maybe five things that you, you maybe haven't considered. So, number one, make sure that you plan ahead for large capital sales. The sale of capital assets like a cottage, vacation home, stocks, etc. could trigger old age security clawbacks in the year of sale. When capital gains are triggered by the sale, this will increase taxable income by 50% of the capital gain. This increase in taxable income will also trigger OAS clawbacks if OAS benefits have started and the income crosses the OAS clawback threshold. This is especially important if you have rental properties. If the property doesn't create enough cash flow relative to the equity in the property, these properties may need to be sold to access the capital to help create retirement income. If sold after OAS has started, then this may trigger extra OAS clawbacks, which could have potentially been avoided. I know this isn't always possible, but you could consider RRSP contributions to bring your income back down to under the clawback range, if this makes sense from a long-term planning standpoint. 
If you're over the age of 71 already, but have a spouse who is 71 or younger and have available RRSP room, you could consider a spousal RRSP contribution. That is a RRSP contribution in an account under your spouse's name, but you get the tax deduction. When it comes to large capital sales, every situation is different. So ideally make sure that you do any large capital sales before OAS start has started, but definitely before you or your spouse can no longer take advantage of RRSP contributions. Moving on, number two in ways you can avoid OAS clawback is using the age of your younger spouse to calculate your minimum roof payments. Quite often, I run into situations where people are just not aware that you can do this, but by using your younger spouse's age, this will lower the mandatory minimum annual withdrawal requirement and lower your overall net income for OAS calculations. So give that some thought. Uh, moving on, number three, you should consider deferring CPP, OAS, or both. The first benefit to this is, if you have a normal life expectancy, there's a very good chance that you will receive more over your lifetime. We all like more now, don't we? <laughs> your OAS increases by 0.6% every month, you delay, and your CPP is 0.7% every month. After five years, you will receive 36% more per month of your OAS and 42% more CPP. By delaying, this allows you to increase the ceiling that you can earn before not receiving any OAS. If your income is high from age 65 to 70, consider this strategy. Of course, this strategy does require proper planning as if all you're doing is kicking the can down the road and your income will still be high after age 70, it, it may not be a beneficial long-term plan. Number four, consider drawing down your RRSP early. Partially melting down your RRSP before starting OAS can help avoid OAS clawbacks. RRSP and RIF withdrawals count toward taxable income and if these withdrawals cross over the income threshold, they will trigger OAS clawbacks after the age of 65 or whenever you begin OAS. Let's say, for example, that this year you have pension income of $60,000. You will experience OAS clawback in any RRSP or RIF withdrawal that is above $21,761. This is because the OAS clawback threshold is $81,761 for 2022. In this situation, ideally you would melt down your RRSP a little bit faster before starting OAS and then place those extra withdrawals inside a TFSA to continue growing tax-free. This also gives the added benefit of having tax-free cash in hand for any larger expenditures that may come up in retirement. Another option may be for you to melt down the RRSP and place those funds in a non-registered investment account. Be wary of doing this though, because you will lose out in the tax deferral benefit of your RRSP. So you have to decide the amount you will save and the OAS clawback is worth more than the tax deferral from your RRSP. There are a number of variables at play here and we would recommend that you do seek some professional advice before trying to implement this on your own. Little marketing strategy in there for you. Last but not least, the, fi the final way you can reduce your OAS clawback is by making sure you have the correct investment accounts earning the most optimal investment income. What exactly do I mean by that blurb of a sentence there? <laughs> well, as you may or may not be aware, dividends, capital gains and interest are all taxed at different rates. In most cases, capital gains are the most favourable followed by dividends and then interest. Interest is generally considered the least favorable as every dollar of interest income is treated as a dollar of income. By keeping your interest bearing investments in your registered accounts, you may be able to reduce your overall net income and thus 
put you below the OAS clawback limits. Well that's it for today, I hope you have enjoyed the video and I have given you at least a couple of things to think about if OAS clawback is a concern of yours. As always, if you have any questions, please reach out or drop a line in the comment section below. I will see you next time and if you haven't already done so, now please subscribe to the channel and give us the old thumbs up. Thanks very much and have a great rest of the day.